Hello, my name is Mr. Asprey, and here it is. This is my Edexcel A Level Maths 2024 Predicted Paper 2. Now, please do listen to this introduction so I can explain what this paper is about and how best to use it. First off, disclaimer I've got no idea what's going to be in paper 2. Of course, I don't. All I've done here is I've gone through what I believe to be the biggest topics on the Edexcel spec. And I've just highlighted in yellow the ones that did not come up on paper one. And I've done one question on each of these topics. But there's no guarantee, of course, that these highlighted topics will come up. And there's no guarantee that the unshaded ones won't come up again. Edexcel could do whatever they like and it'd be fair game. How best to use this paper? Go to my Google Drive, download it, do the paper. It's 150 marks, so it should take you three hours. And then once you've done that, come back, watch the video, and see what you got right and wrong, and see if you can pick up any helpful tips as I go through every single question. Where did these questions come from? Well, they all came from uh, Edexcel International A-Level. So I picked this because I've already done every single Edexcel pass paper on my channel. So I didn't want to do questions again just for the sake of it. And also, variation is the key. So just because you've done one question on this paper, it doesn't mean your revision is sorted. Of course it doesn't. So say, for example, you found vectors tricky, you can go to my past papers, where I've got all of them, in a playlist, and you can click on each one, and I've got the questions sorted by topic. So you can just skip to those particular topics which you find difficult. Okay. Um, my live session uh, on Sunday, where I'm going to be doing another predicted paper live, and then those that do sign up will also get a third predicted paper, um, is very close to selling out, um, which is fantastic. So thank you very much for all that support. I may consider doing um, a second one on Sunday, which will be identical to um, the first one. Um, uh, so do check, link in the description uh, if you're interested in that. And then finally, um, this took me a lot of time to make and a lot of effort. So if you can support the channel in any way possible, whether that be subscribing or telling a friend about the channel, then I would be uh, extremely grateful uh, and that would be mean the world to me. Okay, let's get into it. I really hope you enjoy it. I really hope that it's useful. But remember, my key message here is that be thorough with your revision. Be as thorough as possible, do as much variation on questions as you possibly can, and good luck. Okay, we have a circle that's centered at 3, 5 and radius r, and then we have the line which is y is equal to 2x plus k, where k is a constant, and show that when they intersect, we get this rather large and, um, well, rather large equation. Okay, so when they intersect, it means that we need to solve the two equations simultaneously. So first we need to find an equation for the circle. So we know the center uh, and we know the equation of a circle is x minus a, where a is the x coordinate of the center, squared plus y minus b, where b is the y coordinate of the center, and then squared is equal to the radius squared. So now we can solve simultaneously by subbing in the linear equation into this quadratic one. Um, I'm going to expand the first bracket, which gives me um, 6x squared minus, sorry, x squared minus 6x plus 9. Uh, and then when I substitute in, I get 2x minus 5 plus, oh sorry, 2x plus k is the y. Um, so I'm replacing the y with 2x plus k, and then I need to subtract 5 uh, and then square that, and that's equal to r squared. Uh, this is nasty because I means, it means I've got to um, expand out this uh, trinobial, I think they're called. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to get um, uh, 4x squared and then I'm going to get uh, 2x times k and then I'm going to get 2x times minus 5. So that's minus um, uh, 10 uh, x. Okay, uh, so that was me timesing every term by 2x. Now I've got terms every term times every term by k. So that will give me 2xk. Um, it will give me k squared. And it will also give me minus 5k. And then finally I've got terms every term inside by minus 5. So that will give me minus 10x. 
and it will give me uh, minus 5k and then it will also give me minus 5 times minus 5 which is plus 25 and all that is equal to r squared okay great so whenever we do this um, we end up then needing to collect the x squared terms and the x terms and then the constant terms so looking across all the x squared terms together that makes 5x squared okay now let's look at the x terms uh, we've got a minus 6 we got a, a 2k a minus 10 a plus 2k and another minus 10 so that in total there's minus 26 and there's also 2k and 2k so 4k so in total we have 4k minus 26 lots of x okay now over to the constant terms um, so let's pick up uh, these ones first so that's 9 and 25 so that makes 34 and then we've got minus 10k and k squared so that was 34 um, there was a k squared and there was a minus 10k and then we also have um, that's equal to r squared um, so of course what we can do is we can subtract r squared from both sides and set it equal to zero um, and I think that is what they require, yes, yeah, more or less, maybe the 34 swap round, but it's fine. Okay, um, and now um, it says show that 5r squared is equal to k plus p squared, um, given that l is a tangent to the circle. Okay, so classic circle question. When the line is tangent to the circle, it means it only cuts the circle once, which means this horrible equation here has only one solution. And if it has one solution, it means the discriminant is equal to zero. Okay, so let's take the b term, which is the term which is multiplied by the x, and we need to square that. And then we're going to take away four lots of a term, which is five. And then the C term is all the constant terms. So it is 34 plus K squared minus 10K minus R squared. Um, and that is equal to zero. Now, what a first question, eh? <laughs> um, okay, uh, so we can, uh, we can expand uh, this double bracket. We'll get 16K squared. We will get 4K times minus 26. Um, which is minus 104 and we'll get that twice so minus 208 K and then 26 squared is checks notes 676 uh, and then we're going to minus okay so when I multiply this one out essentially you know the 4 and the 5 there that makes minus 20 so I'm just going to times minus 20 into each of these terms um, so that's going to give me um, that times um, 20 is uh, 680 and it'll be negative because of the minus 20 minus 20 K squared that will be plus 20 K no sorry 200 K and then we'll also have on the end there um, plus 20 R squared and that will equal zero Oh no, I just ran out of space. <laughs> that will equal zero. Okay. Great. Uh, what do we do now? We collect like terms. So, um, again, let's go for the uh, the k squareds now. Uh, and we've got um, minus four of those. Um, and then let's go for the uh, k terms of which we have minus 208 and plus 200, so that makes minus eight. And then I can do the constants. So uh, these two together make uh, minus uh, four. Um, and then we've also got this plus uh, 20r squared as well, and that equals zero. Okay, so I can keep the 20r squared on this side and move all the other terms over to the other side like so and then I can divide through by 4 
uh, to get this. Um, and then I can factorize that because that is exactly how they want it, um, which is k plus 1 all squared. Okay, perfect. Right, let's move on to part C. Okay, part C it says the line cuts the y-axis at the point A. Yep, we know that. And it touches the circle at the point B, just like the figure shows. And it says this line, AB, is 2R. Uh, find the value of K. Okay, that's interesting. Well, whenever we have a tangent and a circle, I mean, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw um, the radius on. Uh, because I know that makes a right angle due to our circle theorems. Uh, and I know that's the radius, which is r as well, so that could be helpful. Okay. Um, now, where does k come from? Well, if we look further back in the question, um, k was actually the intercept of the, um, the straight line. Um, so k, this point here, a, is at the point 0, k. Um, so if I draw a line here connecting up to the centre, uh, then that right angle triangle is going to be very helpful. So first off, I need to find the distance um, a to x. Okay, so the distance formula is the square root of the change in the x's, um, which is 3 to 0, so just 3. And then the change in the y's, um, which is 5 minus k or k minus 5. It doesn't actually matter um, because you're going to square it anyway. Uh, okay, um, right. So that's the distance ax. And we've got, we've got a right angle triangle. We've got a right angle triangle. So we can use Pythagoras' theorem. So the two short side squares um, will equal the uh, length of the long side, the hypotenuse, squared. So if I was to square AX, it's just going to remove the, um, the square root sign. Okay, perfect. Uh, so the left-hand side here gives me, um, well, it gives me 4R squared and plus an R squared. So that gives me 5R squared. Uh, and this side gives me 9. And I'll multiply out these brackets to get K squared minus 10K plus 25. Okay, notice if you would have done 5 minus k as well, you would have got the same thing when you multiplied them out. Okay, now how do we proceed? Well, we've got, an, we've got an equation with two unknowns, so that's not particularly helpful. But we know from the last part, um, we know this, that 5r squared was equal to k plus 1 squared. Um, so we knew from the last part that 5r squared... Uh, sorry, 5r squared was equal to k plus 1 all squared. So that is just going to be um, brilliant because we're going to substitute that in and that replaces, that swaps out the r's. So now I've got an equation only in terms of k, um, which is great. Um, 9 plus uh, 25 is uh, 34. So we'll just do that. Um, expanding this out gives me k squared plus 2k plus 1 is equal to k squared minus 10k plus 34. k squares cancel, add 10k to both sides, minus one from both sides. So we get k is equal to 33 over 12 or 11 over four. Beautiful. Okay, vectors next. Um, uh, so, question two, uh, it says find the si size of the angle ABC. So this angle in here, let's call it theta. Um, okay, so if you're doing uh, further maths, you might know a shortcut to do this. Uh, well, at least I hope you do. Uh, but for regular maths, we're going to have to use the cosine rule. So uh, what I'll need for the cosine rule is I will need um, the magnitudes, the distances of each of the sides. Uh, so we'll start with AB. Uh, so that would be the square root of 6 squared plus minus 2 squared uh, plus 3 squared, um, which will give me um, square root 49. Uh, we can also work out BC as well. Uh, so that would be the square root of um, 2 squared uh, plus 5 squared plus 8 squared, which will give me square root 93. Um, now, in order to use the cosine rule, of course, we need all three sides to find the angle. Uh, so I'm going to need to find uh, this side here, A to C. Um, 
which shouldn't be a problem because we know that um, a to c is equal to a to b plus b to c. Uh, so it's just basically going up here and then across there. Uh, and we have all of those ones already, so we can just add those together. Um, so let's add the, uh, let's, well, let me write it out in, in total. Should I do it in the A's and, I's and J's or column? Mm, I'm feeling I's and J's today. So it'd be this one plus um, this one. And that will equal um, 8i uh, plus 3j plus 11k. So now I can work out the magnitude of that vector. And that will be square root of 8 squared plus 3 squared plus 11 squared. And that gives me um, square root 194. Okay, great. So now let's use the cosine rule. Um, you're not given this, so you do have to know it. Hopefully you do remember it uh, from GCSE. Uh, so it looks like this. I can rearrange for cosine um, here, and that would give me b squared plus a squared minus, sorry, b squared plus c squared minus a squared all over 2bc. Okay, so in terms of r, um, example, uh, we're going to have square root b squared, which are the sides that are next to the angle. So that will be 49 and 93 minus 194. And then all over 2 times by b, which is root 49, and c, which is root 93. Okay, so you put that into your calculator. Obviously, you get a decimal. You do cosine to the minus 1 of it, and that gives you your angle. Um, which will be 112.65 uh, to two decimal places. Okay, uh, perfect. Right, let's move on to the next part. Okay, part B. Um, it says find the area of the parallelogram. Well, we've got a triangle here and we have the two sides and the angle in between them. So we can use that the area of the triangle, um, uh, let's just label that uh, A so that we know what we're talking about, uh, is a half times by um, the two sides next to the angle, so root 49 and root 93, multiplied by sine of the angle in between them, which was 112.65. Great. Um, so that is equal to, uh, when I put that into my calculator, I get, I think it's about 31.15. Okay, great. Um, so the area of the parallelogram A, B, C, D, well, just by symmetry, the two areas of each triangle are the same. So the parallelogram is just two times the area of the first triangle we worked out. Uh, and to one decimal place, that gives me 60, uh, 62.3. Um, perfect. Okay, exponential modeling. Um, we have the population of fruit fries is being studied and the number of fruit fries, <laughs> I didn't say that very well. In the population, uh, T days after the start of the study is modeled by this equation, yeah, yada, yada, yada. But what is important actually, very important I would say, is that we make sure that uh, we understand what the units are. So this is days, okay, fine. And that is just the number of fruit flies. So I'm just, it's, it's, not, um, it's not like tens of fruit flies or like hundreds, it's just the number. So actually this that's quite kind. Uh, we don't need to do any uh, changing. Okay, uh, but always good to check. Um, okay, so the number of fruit flies in the population to start the study. Okay, easy peasy. T is equal to zero. Sub that in, we get 350 um, e to the zero over uh, nine plus e to the zero, um, which is 350 over nine plus one, which is 350 over um, 10, so that's 35. Okay. 
um, nice easy marks there. Just always remember that when you sub in a zero into an E function, it doesn't disappear, it gives you one. Okay, um, given that there are 200 fruit flies in the population, 15 days after the start of study, show that K is equal to this. Okay, so that basically means T is 15, because uh, I just checked and it is days, and they do say days here. Um, and the population, uh, which is F, is equal to 200. So we can sub that in and we can solve to find K. So 200 is equal to 350 um, E to the 15 K, uh, subbing in 15 for T. And that's all over 9 plus E to the 15 K. Okay, so I'm going to multiply both sides by that denominator. Uh, that's going to give me uh, 1800. And that's going to give me plus 200e to the 15k. Uh, and that will equal 350e to the 15k. Okay, uh, next thing to do was to be to subtract 200e um, to the 15k from both sides which gives me this, divide through by 150, um, which gives me 12. And then uh, take the natural logarithm of both sides uh, because ln of e to something just cancels down and becomes that something. Um, so therefore we can say that k is 1 15th of ln 12. Perfect, as required. Okay, I'm going to need to grab some more space um, for the next part of the question. Okay, uh, given also that when T is equal to capital T, the number of fruit flies in the population is increasing at a rate of 10 per day. So increasing at a rate. So that means that we need to find the derivative function um, to see what rate it is. So that is uh, dF by dt. Okay, so in order to do that, it means we're going to have to use the quotient rule because it is a uh, fraction. Um, so the quotient rule, I'm not going to spend too much time explaining what it is. Uh, it's V, which is the denominator, multiplied by DU, which is the derivative of the numerator, which will be 30, so 350 uh, KE to the KT. Uh, and that's because the k will come down when you differentiate an e function because the derivative of kt is k. Okay, um, minus, and then we need um, u uh, multiplied by dv, uh, which will be the derivative of the denominator. Let me just grab a little bit more space. I don't want to run out of space. Um, so the derivative of the denominator will be, well, 9 will go to 0, but e to the kt will become ke to the kt. Like that, and that is all divided by um, v squared. Uh, so that will be 9 plus e to the kt squared. Okay, um, let's tidy up the um, denominator before we um, start subbing in any values. Um, because uh, when I multiply um, this by this, that's going to give me um, uh, 3150 uh, k e to the kt. And then when I multiply uh, this by this, that's going to give me plus 350k. And then timesing the e's together means we add the powers. Um, so it'll be two lots of kt. And then over here, this next term will be 350k. And again, we're timesing those two e's together. So I also get um, e to the k. T. Okay, all over. Um, do I expand that out? Uh, no, I don't want to do that yet. Okay, so this is nice because we get some cancellation here. Um, those two will go. 
Okay, and now what I can do is I can sub in my values. So I know the change, the rate of change is equal to 10. Um, so now I'll actually multiply up that denominator by 10, um, which will give me 9 plus e to the kt all squared. And that's equal to just the numerator, which is 315, so 3150 ke to the kt. Okay, so um, saving a bit of time, I can divide through both sides by 10, which is going to, um, well, yeah, it's going to get rid of that 10 and it's going to get rid of that 0 there. Um, and then I can expand this out. So obviously when I do little steps like that, like, you know, I would, if I was in an exam, I would literally write the line out again. But I don't want to bore everyone and make this video like a million hours. So I'm just going to do a few little shortcuts like that. Um, so 81. Um, plus, I'm going to get that times by that twice, so 18 e to the kt, and then I'm also going to get this squared, which again, when I times e to the kt by itself, I get e to the 2 kt, and that's equal to 315 k e to the kt. Ah, uh, tell a lie. Technically, I should have swapped those out for big t's. Let me do that now. Okay, so when I subbed in 10, I should have also subbed in um, the fact that little t has now turned into big T. So I've just done that. Um, okay, so um, now this is looking like a quadratic, believe it or not. Um, we've got e to the 2k capital T. Um, it's going to be like our squared term. Um, and then we're going to have, uh, when I move this over to this side, um, I'll have 18 minus um, 315 k um, e to the kt uh, plus 81 is equal to zero. Wowza. Okay. Okay, so um, we know what our value of k is. Okay, so I can replace this k here. Um, with uh, whatever this value of k is. Now, you can work out a decimal value and it becomes 0 0.6566, let's say. Well, anyway, when I sub it in over here, um, I'm going to get... Um, what am I going to get? I'm going to get minus 34.18e uh, to the kt plus 81. Now again, this is a quadratic. Um, you can solve it uh, by substituting out um, e to the kt like this, because then y squared would be, again, e to the 2kt. So this becomes a quadratic in y, which is y squared minus this 34.18y plus 81, and that equals 0. So I can solve that, and I can get values for y, which are actually e to the k capital T. Uh, and when I do solve it, I get my values of uh, 31.62. And then I also get a second value, which is equal to uh, 2.5615. Okay, but we're not done there because we've still got to solve for um, for t. <laughs> so we're going to take the natural logarithm of both sides, um, and that gives me a kt value of 3.45 over here. And again, taking the natural logarithm of uh, both sides here, I get 0 0.9406. And then finally, we have to divide through by k. And again, we know what the value of k is, so we could just divide through by that k value there. And that gives me a t value of 20.8, and one over here of 5.7. Wowza, what a question. Okay, question number four, logarithmic modeling. Um, and we have um, this relationship uh, an exponential one, and we have the graph, and it says show that it can be expressed um, in this linear form. So what we could do 
um, is we can take the nat not the natural logarithm, log base 10 of both sides. So that gives me log base 10 of n is equal to log uh, base 10 of um, a t to the b. Okay, what we can do next is we can split up that logarithm uh, because the two uh, things inside are, are multiplied. So we can write it as uh, log a plus log t to the b. Uh, and then finally, the other thing we could do with logarithms is if we have an input which is raised to a power, we can bring that power down to become the coefficient, like so. Okay, now it's about um, sort of matching it up to this. So the uh, left hand side, uh, that's all good. I've got that right there. Um, and then what I need is I need my uh, other variable, which is log t, uh, which I have over here. Uh, and that's multiplied by something. So that something must be m, uh, and it must be b. So m and b must be equal. Um, and then finally, the uh, <clears throat> Uh, the y-intercept, the c value here must be this one. Okay, so I could just write it exactly how they have it in the correct order. Um, just like this, just for safety. Uh, we get this. Uh, and now what I can say is I can say that m must equal b, they match up, and also that c must equal log base 10 a, they match up as well. Okay, brilliant. Um, okay, right, so that's that part done. Okay, the next part says that we've got the line of best fit, um, and it says use the information to estimate the number of microbes present um, in the culture three days after the start of the experiment. Okay, so um, what we need to do is we need to actually find the values of M, or B, sorry, and we're the same. <laughs> And also the value of um, uh, log a here, or the value of c, uh, and that will be able, then we'll be able to put it into our actual formula. So once we have a and, uh, and b, then we can uh, use the formula. So what I'll need is I'll need the gradient. So I'm just going to take uh, a big triangle like this, um, and the values that I got. Well, I, I assume that this was like 4.6 up here. Uh, and this was about uh, 1.8 here. Um, so the gap between them, the change in the y, so I got here that, that was 2.8, uh, and then obviously down the bottom it's just 1.2. So the m, the gradient, which is equal to b, is equal to 2.8 over 1.2, um, which is the same as uh, 7 over 3. Okay, uh, and now, well, the C, the C value is the, is the intercept, um, and yeah, I think that's about 1.8. So I can say 1.8 is equal to log base 10 of A. Um, so I can raise each, I can make 10 the base uh, at each side the power. So that gives me 10, uh, and that will cancel the log, so just give me A. So 10 to the 1.8 is equal to A. Um, and that gives me a value of uh, 63.1. Okay, so now we can construct our formula. So n is equal to um, 63.1 times by t um, to the power of 7 over 3. And I'm interested uh, t days, uh, sorry, 3 days, so t is the value for 3. So three is the value for t. <laughs> That's what I meant to say. Uh, and I get this, and I sub that in, and I get approximately um, 819, as I got. Uh, I, I checked the mark scheme, and, and anything like in and, in and around the region of 800 is, is acceptable. Okay. Um, next, okay, got to scroll down. Uh, it says... Interpret the value of the constant a. Okay, now loads of people make a mistake on this because they just assume that a is the y-intercept, so therefore it's just the initial value, so therefore it's the number of uh, microbes present um, at the start of the experiment, but it's not uh, because 
um, the value here um, at the intercept is uh, zero, but the variable we're looking at is log base 10 t. So log base 10 of t is equal to zero. And taking um, uh, 10 as the base of both sides, we get this. So therefore, that's equal to one. So in fact, the answer is, um, it is the, um, it is the number um, of microbes um, present uh, one day after um, the experiment began. So watch out for that. Okay, question five. Um, a relatively straightforward log question. Uh, so what we need to do is um, not that actually. <laughs> we need to subtract it so that we can collect all the logs on the same side. Uh, so that will give me um, minus uh, log of base three of four x. Uh, and then using that classic log rule, we can combine these uh, because there's a subtraction here. It means that we have um, the positive one divided by the negative one like this. And then we can remove the logarithm um, again by just raising each side um, or making free the base of each side. So that becomes free squared and that will cancel the logarithm there. So that'll be just 5x um, plus 7 over 4x. Um, and of course, three squared is nine, so we can just write nine there. Multiply both sides by four x. That gives me this. Um, subtract five x from both sides. So final answer is seven over thirty-one. Nice. Okay, question six: uh, graph transformations. Um, so we have this uh, quadratic graph, and we've been asked to sketch on separate diagrams. Um, the curve after it has been <clears throat> uh, transformed. Okay, so what do we know? F of 2x like that, that is a compression in the x-axis uh, by a scale factor of 2. Or you could say it's like a stretch in the x-axis with a scale factor of 1 over 2. Same thing. Uh, so what will that look like when I draw it? Well, it means that all the points will move closer to the y-axis by a factor of two. So the point on the uh, y-axis will stay the same, um, but we're gonna squish it all inwards like this. Uh, so everything comes a bit closer to the uh, y-axis, uh, like so. So this one is, um, again, it's closer to the y-axis by a factor of, of uh, two, so the x-coordinate is 1.5 now, like that. And here, where it crosses the, um, the x-axis, the x-coordinate there is three. Okay, lovely. Um, and now we are doing another one. Um, and that, to me, looks like a translation. Uh, and that, again, is in the x-axis. Um, and this one will be a translation. And because it's x inside, so it's plus inside the bracket, it'll be a translation left. Okay, so we're not going um, more than three left. So that means we're not gonna get this minimum point hitting the axis. The minimum point is still gonna be on the right-hand side of the axis. So let's just draw it um, there, for example. Um, Okay, so that's going to look like uh, like that. Okay, so what's happened to each of the points? Well, the x coordinate has moved to the left by p, so this becomes x, uh, sorry, 3 minus p, and the y coordinate stays the same. Um, here again, um, it's moved to the left by p. So this becomes uh, 6 minus p, uh, 0. And 
uh, once more this one was at zero zero um, so that now moves to minus p zero uh, like that and I think we're done okay next question is arithmetic sequences um, so we have a um, some information year one year two year three um, and it says that it is going to be an arithmetic sequence great so find the mass extracted in year 14. Well, the formula for the nth term is a n is equal to a plus n minus 1 d. So we're not given that, so you have to, you have to know that one. Um, so the first term, n is equal to 1, um, that gives me a is equal to 480, that's the first term. And the difference, well you can see it's just going down by 15 each time, so the difference is minus 15. So I want year 14, which just quickly checking, like year one is n equal one, so year 14 is n equal 14. Um, so a 14 is what I'm looking for, is the first term a, um, plus n minus one, which is 14 minus one, so um, 13, multiplied by negative 15. Okay, so putting that in, and that gives me a value of um, 285 tons. Okay, good. Make sure you put the units in there because it doesn't ask for the mass of the silver, so make sure you keep the, the units. Okay, um, and now it says after a total of um, this number of tons was extracted, the mining company stopped. Given that this occurred at the end of year N. So that means that they're adding up each amount which they extract each year. So that's a summation. So we're going to need the sum formula, um, which is given in your formula booklet. Uh, it looks like this. Uh, and we can just substitute into this. So we know that the total is... Uh, this amount and we know that the year we're looking for is capital N um, and that is over 2 uh, and that's times by uh, 2 times by A which we said was 480 plus capital N minus 1 and that's multiplied by minus 15. Okay great um, so what I'll do here is I'll times both sides um, by uh, 2 uh, and that gives me 15,540 uh, and that gets rid of the divide by 2 here. Um, 2 times 480 is uh, 960 and that's going to give me minus 15n and it's going to give me plus 15 like that. Okay good. Uh, so carrying on working through, that's going to give me minus 15n squared. Uh, I'm going to get 960 plus 15 is 975, and then I need to multiply that by n as well. Okay, I suspect we could divide through by 15, or at least 5. Yeah, so we could divide through by 15, uh, and that gives me uh, this amount, uh, and that gives me minus n squared, and dividing this through by 15, it gives me 65. Okay, that's perfect, because that's exactly um, kind of what they're asking for. So let's just bring it all to one side, and we are good to go. Okay, great. Um, okay, so you can solve this on your calculator, and you'll end up with um, two positive answers, which is quite interesting. Um, so we have to decide which one to select, um, and the answer is uh, 28, uh, the first one, uh, because that's the first time that they hit that amount, that target. Uh, the reason why they hit it again um, is a limitation of the model, really, because the difference is changing by um, negative 15. The ne negative 15 is the difference. So eventually, um, you're going to keep adding on um, amounts which are getting smaller and smaller and then eventually you'll start adding on negative amounts which obviously isn't possible um, so that's why it's going to go up to 7,770 keep going up keep going up and then it's going to start coming down again 
and that's why you're going to hit it again but again that's a limitation of the model okay uh, right next question uh, so recursive uh, sequences um, and we have it defined like this and we have the first term and it says express the second term okay so a2 is equal to me substituting in um, a1 in for a n because that will give me a n plus 1 which will be a2 so that's two lots of um, p minus 3 uh, plus 3 squared minus 7 um, which gives me two lots of p squared minus 7 okay perfect that's for one mark job done okay so for two marks uh, sorry for six marks it says that the sum of the first three terms is equal to p plus 15 uh, find the possible values of a2 okay so what I'll need to do um, the summation of the first three terms of a n is obviously equal to a1 plus a2 plus a3 so I might need to go and find myself a3 and I'll do that by subbing a2 back into the uh, the formula so that gives me two lots of 2p squared minus 7 plus 3 all squared minus 7 okay so that is two lots of 2p squared um, minus 4 all squared minus 7 uh, which is two lots of when I square this I get 4p to the 4 I get minus 8p squared twice so minus 16p squared and I get a minus 4 times by itself so that's plus 16 and then I'm minusing 7 uh, so overall that is 8p to the 4 minus 32p squared plus 32 but then minus 7 so that's plus 25 perfect <laughs> um, so the summation uh, let's get back to it so now um, we need uh, a1 uh, which we're told was that okay so that goes in here p minus 3 uh, and then we needed to add on a2 um, which was this one here so that is plus 2p squared minus 7 and then finally we need to add on as well um, P sorry a3 which is all this okay so that is plus 8p to the 4 minus 3p squared plus 25 and we're told that is going to equal P minus on oh no, a P plus 15 that's the summation as it says over here okay right let's do some cancelling um, we have P and P on both sides um, and we will have minus 3 minus 7 which is minus 10 plus 25 will give me plus 15 which cancels with that plus plus 15 on that side okay um, so again, I probably wouldn't do that method. I would just just write it out again uh, the line below, but uh, I'm just being a little bit too a little bit speedy. <laughs> so minus thirty p squared, um, and that's equal to zero. Lovely. So we can take out a p squared and get eight p squared minus. In fact, let's take out a two p squared, and that gives me four p squared minus fifteen. Is equal to zero so my solutions are p squared equals zero or um, p squared is equal to 15 over 4 and in fact uh, I don't need to solve for p because I've just been asked to find a2 um, and a2 is this one uh, whoops uh, so I could just sub in p squared so a2 is um, minus 7 when I sub in 0 for p squared or a2 is um, a half when I sub in that one beautiful 
Okay, trigonometric identities and equations. This one's a bit of a beast, to be honest. Um, you can start either side um, and come to the correct answer. I think perhaps the easiest way, which I found, was to start with the right-hand side, personally. But, you know, everyone's different, so uh, don't uh, destroy me in the comments. If you think there's a better way, just be nice. <laughs> Uh, 4 cot 2x uh, cosec 2x. Um, so I said that that was equal to 4. And then the double angle for tan is, um, let's just write it over here. Tan uh, 2x is 2 tan x over 1 minus tan squared x. So the double angle for cot was just a reciprocal of the double angle for tan, because obviously cot is a reciprocal of tan. Um, so I can put in here 1 minus tan squared x over um, 2 tan x. Okay, lovely. And then I'm multiplying that by cosec 2x. <clears throat> and again, the double angle for sine is uh, 2 sine x uh, cos x. So this will be the reciprocal of that because cosec is the reciprocal of sine. So I'm multiplying by 1 over uh, 2 sine x cos x. Okay. Um, so let's um, expand out, I guess. Um, on the top, we're going to get 4 lots of 1 minus tan squared x and on the bottom we're going to get 2 times 2 so 4 also and we're going to get tan x um, sine x cos x all three of them how exciting uh, and that is going to cancel like that um, and also we know that um, tan x is sine x over cos x. So tan times sine times cos is going to be, I mean, this is a proof question, so I guess I should write it out like this. Um, so that will be sine x over cos x times by sine x cos x. Uh, and then we can see that uh, timesing through the cos x is going to cancel. So we're going to get sine squared on the bottom. So that's 1 minus tan squared x over sine squared x. I'm starting to think maybe this isn't the most efficient way of doing it. But I'm in now, uh, and I will soldier on. So we can divide each term on the top by sine squared. So 1 divided by sine squared is just cosec squared. And then tan squared divided by sine squared. Okay, what's that? So tan squared x over sine squared x is the same as um, uh, tan squared, which is sine squared over cos squared, divided by sine squared x, which is that. Uh, we can then, when we divide fractions, we can swap over um, the um, the fraction like that and multiply it, so those are going to cancel. So it's just 1 over cosine squared, um, which is sec squared. Okay, uh, I feel like I'm going to get roasted for this question. <laughs> uh, cosec squared is... Um, is equal to uh, 1 plus cot squared. True story. And sec squared is equal to 1 plus tan squared. Uh, so overall, the ones will cancel, and uh, with minimal space left, uh, because I've faffed around a lot, we get cot squared minus tan squared. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> right, part two. Oh, before I go, I just want to complete the proof by saying that's equal to the left-hand side. Um, so therefore, it is proved. 
Okay, part B, it says hence solve. Um, and well, these are perfect, aren't they? That's exactly the same as that. Uh, the only difference is we've just swapped x is equal to uh, theta. So we can just swap them over now. So we can say that uh, cot squared theta minus tan squared theta is equal to 2 tan squared theta. Great. Okay, so naturally we would want to collect up the tan squares here, of which we have three of them on this side. Um, and then cot squared is the reciprocal of tan squared, so that's the same as 1 over tan squared. Um, so we're going to multiply across and we're going to get um, 3 tan to the 4 theta. How exciting. And we're going to divide through by 3. And then we're going to take the fourth root. Now when you take an even root, you will get plus minus. So it will be plus minus uh, the fourth root of um, 1 over 3. Okay. Um, and then when we put in the um, um, the positive, and we do um, so we do inverse tan of positive fourth root of a third. Um, that gives me a value of 0 0.65. Um, and then when I do inverse tan of uh, negative the fourth root of a third. That gives me minus 0 0.65. Okay, and then how do we find additional values for tan? Um, well, the simple way of doing it is just adding pi or taking away pi each time. Um, and of course we can see here, because the uh, the range um, is between uh, minus a half pi and, and uh, pi of two, a half pi, then adding on pi or subtracting pi um, is going to push us out of the range. Yeah, absolutely it will do. So those are our two final answers. Perfect. Okay, differentiation, uh, year one modeling. Um, and uh, it says here that we've got this shape. Um, and it says show that the surface area of the brick is given like this. Okay, so this is such a classic question. Uh, we're going to start by finding the volume, um, which, because we get given what the volume is, uh, and that would be, um, well, length times uh, width times by height. Um, so that means that 972, which is the volume, is equal to 3x squared h. Okay, so that could be helpful. Uh, now let's try and work out the surface area, which is what they asked for. I think they just call it s, actually. So I just need to write s. So um, this side is going to be x times h, and there are going to be two of those because obviously there's a front and a back. Um, and then this side here is going to be 3xh, and again there's going to be two of those because a front and the back, so that's going to make 6xh. And then the top um, is going to be x times 3x, so that's 3x squared. Uh, and again, there's two of those, so that's 6x squared. Okay, um, that's good. That gives me 6x squared, and it gives me, when I add these two together, 8xh. Um, so I need to replace the h here. Um, so um, what am I going to do? I'm going to... I should have done a bit more over here, shouldn't I? Let's just move you down a little bit. No problem. Uh, divide through by 3 is going to give me um, 324 um, x squared h. And then why not? Let's just divide through by x squared. Well, in fact, I don't need to divide through by x squared. I just need to divide through by x. Um, because that gives me x h. And then I can just replace that um, nice and neatly with the x h here. Okay. Um, so that means that s is equal to 6x squared plus 8 lots of 3 uh, to 4 over x, like so. Um, and that will give me uh, as required. So that will give me 
uh, s is equal to 6x squared plus 2592 over x. Perfect. Okay, next question asks me to find um, ds by dx. So in order to do that, I just need to write it in a form which I could differentiate it, which would be plus uh, 2592x to the minus 1. Uh, so now I can differentiate this, and that gives me uh, 12x. Uh, the minus comes down, so minus 2592x to the negative 2. Drop the power down by 1. Um, it then says, hence find the value um, where x is uh, for a value of x for which s is stationary. So that means that the derivative is equal to 0. So I can say this is equal to 0. Uh, and then whenever I have a negative power like this, uh, what I'm going to do is <clears throat> so I'm going to multiply uh, both sides by x to the power 2. <clears throat> uh, so that's going to give me 12x cubed. And then that's going to cancel that negative power there nicely. So I'm going to end up with... Um, 12x cubed is equal to 2592. Um, I'm going to divide that by 12, and that's going to give me um, x cubed is equal to 216, so x is equal to 6. Perfect. Okay, um, Part D has asked us to then find the second derivative. So I've got to differentiate again. Um, and this will give me, well, 12x will differentiate to 12. Um, the minus 2 will come down and multiply by this. And that will give me positive um, 5184. And then the power will drop down by 1. So that's x to the minus 3. Um, and then it says and hence show that the value of x found will give a minimum value of s. So that means that the second derivative will be greater than 0 when I sub in x equals 6. So I can say at x equals 6, uh, the second derivative um, is equal to 12 plus um, this, like that. Um, and that gives me a value of uh, 36, in fact, um, which is greater than 0. And then I can say, therefore, um, s is minimum um, at x equals 6. Okay. Um, and then finally, part E, hence find the minimum surface area of the brick. Well, that happens when x equals 6. And the formula for the surface area is um, what's well, given right here. <laughs> so I just need to sub in x, uh, x is equal to 6. So 6 times 6 squared plus 2592 over 6. Uh, and that gives me a value of 648. Uh, and that will be centimeters squared. Beautiful. Uh, that will be centimeters as well. Hey. Differentiation, product and chain rules. Because uh, we had the quotient rule in paper one. Um, okay, so we've got this function here. Um, and it's asked us to find the range of it. Well, that's interesting. Well, we can see here uh, quite clearly that it has a, a maximum point right there. And that happens when here x equals 0. Um, so if I just sub in um, 0 into the function, that's going to give me um, e to the 0, uh, and then just minus 3 all squared, uh, which is just going to give me 9. Um, and I can see here also that it just it hits the, um, uh, the x-axis right there. Um, and that is obviously the solution uh, to this bracket here. Um, then it won't hit the x-axis again, uh, and it certainly won't go below the x-axis. So I can say there for that the range um, is between 0, which it does equal at a certain point, um, f of x, and it does also equal 9. Okay, perfect. 
Right, part B is asking us to differentiate this. So this is a product. Um, so I'm going to have to, uh, what I like to do is just to highlight each part like that. Uh, and then I differentiate, um, in this case, let's differentiate the yellow first. Now to do that, I need to use the chain rule um, because well, essentially this is e to the u where u is equal to minus x squared. You differentiate this one and you differentiate this one and then you multiply these two together. So that gives you minus 2x e to the minus x squared because u is again minus x squared. So that's the yellow one differentiated. Um, so that means that I'm going to keep the blue one the same this time like that. And then I'm going to add um, keeping the yellow one the same and differentiating the blue one. Um, so again, this is a, a chain rule where I have um, u squared, where u is equal to 2x squared minus 3. Differentiate this gives me 2u and differentiate this gives me 4x. And it's just these two multiplied together. So that is times by 4x times by 2 and u is 2x squared minus 3. Okay, perfect. Um, let me just write that. That is the derivative function. Okay, uh, so we're good to go. Uh, and what I can do is I can take out some factors. So uh, what do they have in common? Well, they have one of these brackets uh, in common. They also have um, e to the negative x squared in common. Uh, and they also have a, um, a 2x, don't they? So 2x there and an x and a 2 there. So my factor I'm going to take out <clears throat> is going to be um, 2x, uh, the bracket, and then e to the minus x squared. <clears throat> and of course, we can see it here as well. So they give us a little helping hand, which is nice. Okay, so when that factor has come out, what have I got left? Well, the first term, <clears throat> I've not got anything left really, have I? Oh no, I do, sorry. I've got a negative and I've also got one more of these brackets, because I've only taken one bracket out and this is the bracket times by itself, uh, well, well, times twice, so I've still got to do uh, one more. So that's minus this bracket. Okay, what about over here? Here I've just got 4, so plus 4. Okay, great. Um, so now what we can do is we can um, <clears throat> expand this out, this other bracket, and I'm going to get a minus x squared, uh, a minus 2x squared, which I'll put here, and I'm going to get a minus times minus 3, which is plus 3, and plus 4 is going to give me 7. Um, so therefore I can say that A is equal to 7 and B is equal to 2. Yes, that works. Okay, uh, next part uh, says that given the line Y is equal to K, that's a horizontal line, um, intersects the curve at exactly two distinct points. Find the um, exact range values of K. Well. If I were to draw a horizontal line here, that's no good. That intersects loads of times. Um, now, if I was to draw a horizontal line here, that is quite interesting because that intersects one, two, three, four times. But if I were to draw a line anywhere above that, then that would be good, wouldn't it? That would intersect the two distinct times, which is where I want it to. Um, and then what about if I was to draw a line right at the top, um, that would be, uh, I didn't do that very well, uh, you know what I mean, if I was to draw one like that, uh, a straight line, then that would only be once, but anything underneath that would be good. So it's in between those two blue lines basically. Okay, so the first blue line we know is 9. 
so I know that my k value um, is going to be uh, less than 9. Can't equal 9 because otherwise that would just be one intersection point. So what about this other blue line? Well, this blue line is on these maximum points, these local maximums right here and right here. So that happens when the derivative is equal to 0. So how can this? Well, this is nicely factorized, so it means we can just pull out the, um, the values um, when it's equal to 0. So we can either get this one, which is when x is equal to 0, uh, which is this maximum, which is not what we're after. Or we could get this, which would mean that 2x squared would equal, um, oh, sorry, 2x squared minus 3 equals 0. So that means that 2x squared would equal 3 in that scenario. So x squared would equal 3 over 2. <clears throat> uh, so x would equal plus or minus um, plus or minus the square root of 3 over 2. And that's why we're going to get 2. Um, perhaps, perhaps. Not, not quite sure yet. Uh, what about this one then? So that's another uh, factor. So which then that could equal 0. Uh, so if that's the case, then that would give me um, 2x squared equal to 7. Uh, yeah, that's right. And that means that x squared would equal to 7 over 2. So x would equal plus minus the square root of 7 over 2. Okay, so clearly this one uh, is larger in magnitude. So that one is going to be the, um, the one we're after. Uh, because it's going to represent uh, these two. Um, that's going to be that one. And then the other one uh, would be the smaller values, which would be uh, these ones. <clears throat> okay, but we need to find the actual y value at that particular point, don't we? Because that's the horizontal line. So the y value, I need to sub back into f of x. Um, so f of x um, at the point um, x equals plus or minus the square root of 7 over 2 is going to give me, well actually it's quite nice, I'm going to use this uh, because uh, I'm actually subbing an x squared for, for, for every part. So that's going to be e to the minus 7 over 2 and it's going to be 2 times by 7 over 2 x squared uh, minus 3 squared. And that is 7 minus 3, which is 4, so 16. So that's 16e to the minus 7 over 2. Uh, it does say give it the exact range. So that is this um, y value here. Now we want everything above that, so we need to do this symbol here uh, to say that k is bounded in between these two blue lines, but not equal to them. Perfect. Okay, we've got a very nice question, this one. Uh, if you know how to differentiate implicitly, um, this is a very, very generous five marks. I'm not sure that um, uh, UK at Excel would be so generous, but nevertheless, let's um, differentiate. So we get 3x squared. <clears throat> and now this is a product. Uh, so we need to split it up into uh, two different parts. And we will differentiate the um, green one first, which gives me 2, and leave the blue one alone. And then we will leave the green one alone and we'll differentiate the blue one. And y differentiates to dy by dx when differentiating with respect to x, which is what we're doing. Okay, next we get minus 1 when we differentiate x. And here we differentiate um, with respect to y but then multiply by dy by dx. So now we're actually differentiating with respect to x, which is what we need to do. Minus 20 goes to 0, and so does 0. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're going to collect up onto the same side all of the terms that involve a dy by dx. So I'm going to move them over to the other side, so that one becomes a positive 3y squared dy by dx. And this becomes a negative 2x dy by dx. We can then factorize out that dy by dx, and that will leave me with 3y squared, whoops, 
minus 2x as my factor. And then finally, I will just divide through by that factor. Uh, you may get an answer which is where the, all the terms are just negative uh, compared to my one, uh, which would still be perfectly um, a valid, uh, equivalent answer. Okay, um, now part B asks us to find um, the equation of the tangent at this particular point. Okay. All right, so we've got the point. We just need the gradient, don't we? Yeah, so that's not as difficult as I was uh, initially thinking it was. Uh, three, three squared. So I'm subbing in x is three into the gradient function. Uh, plus two, lots of minus two, uh, minus one. All over uh, three, lots of minus two squared. And then minus two, lots of three. Okay, um, so when I sub that in, I get uh, 27 minus 4 minus 1 over 12 minus 6, which is the same as 22 over 6, um, which is 11 over 3. Um, right, now we need to do a straight line. So y minus uh, y1 is equal to m x minus x1, we've got the gradient, we got the point, we just need to sub in. So that's going to give me y minus the y coordinate is minus 2, so y minus minus 2 is the same as y plus 2. The gradient is 11 over 3, and we've got x minus the x coordinate, which is 3. Okay, once it in this form where they're all integers, so multiply everything through by 3, it gives me 3y plus 6 and then multiply the 3 onto this side and multiply the 11 into this bracket, which gives me 11x minus 33. Bring it all over to one side. I don't think it matters which side. I'm going to pick this side just to, I don't know why. Minus 11x plus 3y plus 39 equals zero. Gosh. Okay, iteration. Iteration questions can be really nasty. And when I saw this question, I thought it was going to be a really nasty one. Um, a bit like the one in 2022, if you know it. Um, but actually, it's not as bad as it first seems. Um, anyhow, uh, it says that we've got this profit formula. Um, again, so important when we're doing modeling, highlight the units. Because I can't tell you how many times that has messed up students, and me as well. It messes me up all the time. Uh, so it's in millions <clears throat> and in years. So show that, um, that exactly one year after trading, so when t is equal to 1, basically, um, <clears throat> uh, we have a profit of, a, of negative uh, 830,000. Okay, fine. So... Uh, just sub in one basically just show that you're subbing in one <clears throat> uh, so i will do that like so learn of um, that's one plus one on top and that's um, two lots of one plus one all squared great uh, so that gives me uh, three over ten uh, and that gives me three over four ln of two over nine. Yeah, two over nine. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's good. Okay, uh, so then we can type that into our calculator and it comes out minus 0 0.828, um, which is approximately um, negative 830,000 uh, pounds. Uh, because again, it's in millions of pounds. Um, whew, quite a big loss. Okay, uh, part B. Um, okay, so it, company, the manager of the company wants to know the value for T for which P is equal to zero. 
um, show that this value of t occurs between the interval of seven, uh, 6 and 7. So we have to use the change of sign method here. So I need to work out the profit um, when t is 6. Um, and I just sub that into the formula. I'm not going to bore you um, showing you that. Um, you just get this value here. Uh, and then you do the same for, um, for t is equal to 7. Uh, and you get this value here. And then you have to write that there is a change of sign and f of x is continuous on the interval 6, 7. Therefore, root lies in 6, 7. Perfect. Real classic, that. OK, uh, moving on to part C. Um, so it says, show that the equation for p is equal to 0 can be expressed in this form. Um, so this is, again, what I thought might be the, the tricky question, but um, in fact, it's, it's relatively straightforward. You just need to make this t uh, here the subject. Um, so I'll first off multiply through by 10. Um, oh, and of course, p is equal to 0. So multiplying through by 10 still gives me 0. Um, and it will give me um, 4t minus 1 uh, plus um, 30 over 4 ln of um, this thing here. So t plus 1 over 2t plus a 1 all squared. Okay, um, and then we want to make again this t here the subject. So I'm going to move everything else over to the other side. Um, which will give me 1, um, and it will give me minus uh, 30 over 4, which is also 15 over 2, um, ln um, of, again, t plus 1 over 2t plus 1 all squared. And that now equals 4t. Um, and then we just need to uh, divide by 4 which is going to give me 1 quarter, again, minus um, 15 over 8 ln um, of this thing here. Uh, and then the only tricky part here is the fact that you've got a negative ln here. And of course, the coefficient um, can become the power. So I can take this negative 1, which I'm multiplying through by, and raise it to the power. And what that does, or negative 1, if it's the power, then it makes the fraction the reciprocal. So it's plus 15 um, over 8 ln. And I might actually show that by actually writing it like this, because it is a show that question. So I want to make sure uh, uh, the examiner knows that I know what I'm doing. Um, and then that would then allow us to uh, make this the reciprocal. So that's 2 t plus 1 all squared over t plus 1 and that equals t and I think that's good yeah perfect <clears throat> okay um, right we need the calculator for this next part okay I generally think this is the most enjoyable part of the maths exam uh, and that is substituting in into iter iteration formula so t, um, t1 is equal to 6. <laughs> so you do 6 equals. And then you type in your formula. OK, uh, and then I'm, I'm genuinely, genuinely excited right now. This is, uh, this is going to be fun. Um, OK, so I need to do a fraction, <laughs> square bracket, two lots of the answer plus 1 squared over the answer again plus 1 close bracket okay right we're good to go so what does it ask for it asks for t2 okay so we've got t1 already so we just press equals once that is t2 so t2 is 6.21997 um, which is approximately um, 2 point, uh, sorry, 6.2 to three decimal places, um, 2, 0. Okay, uh, sorry. Yeah, there we go. 
Uh, that's T2. Yeah, make sure I label that up nice. Nice. Okay, and then T6. I'm at T2 already, so I've pressed so two. I've had two goes. And now three, four, five, six. Beautiful. So that is three, uh, 6.314158, which to three decimal places is 6.314. Lovely. Okay. Um, and it says, hence, according to the model, how many months it takes in total uh, from when the company started trading for it to make profit? Well, if I keep on tapping equals, it's going to converge on the root. Um, and then once it stops, that's the root converged. Um, so I could take that value. And that's actually the number of um, years. Uh, which again is really cheeky. That's why I always highlight these things here. So T is the number of years. Um, so that's just really going to trip people up. So I need to multiply that by 12 to get the number of months. Um, so that is, um, again, approximately 75.78 months. Um, and I think it's how many months would it takes it takes in total. So I think it would take a total of seventy six months for it to start turning profit. Um, rounding that up, because obviously after seventy five they've not made profit yet. Okay, question fourteen. We've got classic partial fractions. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the denominator here. It's already set up nicely for us as well. And just multiply that across through to the whole right hand side. <clears throat> so that gives me 1 is equal to, um, the x will cancel um, with the x on the bottom, so I get a lots of 3x minus 1 squared. Uh, and then multiply through again, and that's going to give me uh, bx3x minus 1. And if you've ever seen me do a shortcut for partial fractions, um, then it doesn't work for all different types of partial fractions. It wouldn't work for this one because we've got the repeated root. So I'm just going to have to do it the long way. Um, which gives me this. And then what we do is we figure out um, what x values would solve one of these brackets. Well, I could let x equal 0 at the start. Uh, to start with, sorry. Uh, and that gives me um, a, because uh, that's minus 1 squared, which is 1. Uh, and those ones will cancel, so a is equal to 1. OK, lovely. Uh, next one, I would do x is equal to a third. Uh, which gives me 1 is equal to that cancels, that cancels, and I just get a third C, uh, which means C is equal to um, 3. Okay, this is going very well. And then the final one, you could just sub in anything. So the easiest thing, I think, is just 1. Um, so that will give me 2 squared, so 4A. Uh, that will give me um, 2B. Um, and this will give me... Um, just C. Uh, I don't know if I'll put equals there. Whoops. Go away. So plus C. Okay, uh, and we know that A is uh, 1, so that's 4. And we know that C is 3, so that's 7. Take it away, gives me minus 6. So it looks like B is equal to minus 3. Uh, perfect. Okay, so it does. Oh, it just says find the value, so I don't need to write it out again. Uh, to show that I found the uh, the partial fractions, um, I just need to. I'm done. Basically, I'm done. Lovely. Okay. Um, right. I think I've got space here to uh, integrate that as well. So I, if I'm integrating um, f of x uh, dx, um, then that will equal uh, the integral of. Um, what will that equal the integral of a uh, over uh, x um, minus 3 over 3x uh, minus 1. And then the c value is 3. And I've run out of space. How annoying. So the c value is 1, but I'm just going to write that as um, rather not like a fraction, but as a, uh, a bracket with a negative power because uh, it's easier to integrate. Uh, I need to put that in brackets uh, and then multiply it all through by dx. Okay, so 1 over x integrates to ln x. 
Um, this here, well, the denominator um, as derivative is the numerator. So then we can just go straight in to learn of uh, the denominator. Uh, and this one, I need to up the power, uh, which would go to minus 1. I need to then divide by the new power, so that will turn it to a negative. And I also need to divide by the derivative of the bracket, which is free, which will cancel the free outside. So that's it. Uh, and then I write plus c as well because I've not got any limits. Okay, next part um, is asking me to actually sub in limits between uh, 2 and 1. So uh, I can write the integral uh, between 2 and 1 of f of x uh, dx is equal to um, I've already integrated it, so it's to sub in the limits. So ln 2 minus ln of 6 minus 1, which is 5. And then subbing in 2 there gives me um, uh, a fifth, because uh, that's 5 to the power minus 1. OK, um, so that's the upper limit. And then subtract the lower limit, um, which is when I sub in 1. So I get ln 1, and I get minus... Uh, ln of 2 and then I also get um, minus uh, 1 over 2 okay great so what have I got I've got ln 2 and I've got minus minus a ln 2 so that's that's 2 ln 2 uh, I've got minus a ln 5 and I've got a minus a fifth and then a minus and a minus a half. So that is minus a fifth plus a half, um, which is um, plus um, uh, 3 over 10. OK, great. Um, and it wants it in this form, which is really important. Uh, so I need to have just uh, no, co no coefficient in front of the ln. So I'm going to uh, bring that 2 up to become the power. So that makes 2 to the 2, which is 4. Uh -huh. um, and then we can combine those learns like so, using log rules. Um, and I think we're good. And then I'll write it this way around, because it does say to write it that way around. Um, and I'll also just state that a is 3 over 10, and that b is equal to 4 over 5. Perfect. Okay, we've got uh, integration by parts, um, and it says find in terms of ln2 the x coordinate of the point A. Okay, so that happens um, when y is equal to 0. So I can say that um, 0 is equal to 4x minus x e to the half x. Um, I can factorize out an x, um, which gives me this. Um, this one is obviously going to give me x equals 0, which is this one over here, so that's not useful for us. Um, but this one is going to give me uh, 4 minus e to the half x equals 0. So therefore, 4 is equal to e to the half x. Um, taking a natural logarithm of both sides gives me ln 4 is equal to a half x. Times it by 2, that uh, gives me 2 ln 4 is equal to x. Now, <clears throat> um, 2 ln 4 is the same as 2 ln um, 2 to the 2. Um, so I can then... Uh, bring this 2 uh, to the front using uh, uh, log rules. So that gives me 4. So 2 times 2, 4, and then ln 2. Um, perfect. Uh, it just says the x-coordinate, so I don't need to write uh, it in coordinate form. Okay, next part is asking me to integrate. Um, okay, so yes, that is an integration by parts. Uh, I'm going to use the di method. Uh, because I love it. Um, <clears throat> so we've got plus, minus, plus, minus. Uh, we have x, because always the um, polynomial goes into the differentiation column, unless there's a ln x. Uh, 1 and 0. When I differentiate that, I get 1. Then when I differentiate that, I get 0. 
e to the half x, um, that integrates to, we need to divide by the derivative of a half x, which is dividing by a half, which is the same as timesing by two. And then the e functions, they uh, different integrate to themselves. And then again, um, again, we, the half derivative comes out. We divide by half, so it's the same as times it by two. Okay, um, so the DI method, all we need to do is just multiply down that wiggly line. Um, and then in this case, we're going to do that twice uh, and no more because the final one will just be zero, so we don't need to do that. Um, so great, so we can just say the integral uh, of x e to the half x dx is equal to, <clears throat> uh, times in the yellow ones gives me 2x e to the half x, and then times in the blue one gives me minus 4e to the half x, and that is plus c. Perfect. Okay, next um, we need to find, it looks to me like that exact value of the area, um, but, um, <laughs> It's, it was not the integral that we've done. Um, the integral we've done is just this part. And of course the curve has this part to it as well. So uh, if I want to find the area, uh, then I need to integrate obviously the whole curve. Um, so this, and then what I could do is I could do them separately as well. So you can always, uh, if, you, if two parts of a function are you know, added or subtracted, then you can integrate them separately um, if you so wish. Um, so we'll do that because we've already done this one. So, you know, uh, that's going to be nice. Uh, up the power divided by the new power gives me um, uh, 2x squared. Um, and of course, sorry, I've got to put my limits on as well, haven't I? Uh, because uh, it, it goes from here and here. We've already got that x uh, value, so it's fallen 2 and 0, uh, fallen 2 and 0. Okay, so I get 2x squared, basically, um, and then this one is just the same as that one, but it's the negative of that, so I need to do minus 2x e to the half x, and then that becomes plus 4e to the half x. Um, and that is all between uh, 4 and 2 and 0. Okay, let me grab some more space. Okay, so subbing in is not trivial. Um, we get two lots of uh, 4 ln 2 squared minus two lots of 4 ln 2, um, which is going to be 8 ln 2. And then, in fact, let's just do this separately on the side over here. Um, because 4 ln 2... Um, is, as we've shown already, was the same as 2 ln 4, um, just by um, uh, taking up a factor of 2 to the power. Um, and then, if I want to do e um, of a half of, let's write it as 2 ln 4, then that gives me um, just e to the ln 4, uh, which gives me 4. So basically when I sub that into uh, this e function here, um, I get 4. So I need to also multiply by 4 here. And then when I sub in again, I'm going to get just plus 4 times by this e function, which we said when we, in, when we sub in 4 ln 2, we get 4. Okay, so that's just that's the positive part. Um, or sorry, the upper it's the upper limit. The the lower limit when we sub in zero. Well, that goes to zero. That goes to zero, and e to the zero is one. So we're just left with four. Okay, great. Um, so what are we going to get? Okay, so this is two times by, and when I square, uh, four squared is sixteen. And ln2 squared, I'll just keep like that, ln2 squared. Um, minus uh, 4 times 8, which is 32, again ln2. And then plus um, 16, and then minus the 4. So this is 32 ln2 squared, which we can't simplify, by the way. That's why I'm just leaving it as ln2 squared. 
Um, remember, that's it's very very different to ln two, where the two is squared, because that can be simplified to you know the two can come down, so it'd be four ln two. Sorry, two ln two. But this is the whole ln two has been squared, not just the input of the logarithm. Okay, um, so minus thirty two ln two, and then plus twelve. Um, and I think that is good. Yes, it is. Lovely. Okay, uh, trapezium rule. Uh, interesting one because um, they give you all the values. Um, so all you need to do is just actually do the calculation, um, which is nice. Um, so the integral between minus between 1 and minus 1 um, of f of x uh, dx is approximately equal to uh, the height which is the gap between the x's, which in this case is um, uh, 0 0.5, over 2. Um, and then we need to do the endpoints plus two lots of any of the middle ones. Uh, middles. OK, so that's approximately equal to um, a half divided by 2 is a quarter. Um, and again, I'm just I'll, I'll just write out um, what I need to put into my calculator, um, and uh, but I won't bore you doing it. Uh, so that's what we've got to put in, and that will give me uh, 10.52 uh, to two decimal places. Okay, so that's part A, um, and then uh, part B um, is this, uh, which I think is quite interesting. And I think this is probably the, you know, it's the hardest trapezium rule gets, really, when they ask you to do the trapezium rule and then find the integral of some function which is slightly different. So what I could do is I can write this. Again, because um, these two uh, values are um, uh, what's well, subtracted, um, I can say that it's the same as integrating them separately and then subtracting them. Uh, so I could just integrate 2 uh, dx. Um, okay, uh, so let me just uh, move that along, uh, just so it's nice and neat, uh, because this is going to be the integral of um, this f of x uh, minus 2 dx, and we're going to say that that is uh, equal to this, um, and then we're going to say it's approximately equal to, we've done that one already, it's 10.4, sorry, 10.52. Now this one um, is going to be, uh, well, 2x when I sub in uh, 1 and minus 1. Um, and when I do that, uh, it's going to give me, um, well, 2 and then minus, minus 2. So that's 4. So I'm taking away 4. Um, so that is approximately equal to 6.52. Okay. Uh, that's part B. Uh, and part C, I can just do over here because it's actually quite straightforward. Um, it's a bit cheeky because it's telling me here that the function is shifted along two uh, units. Um, so the function is going to look something like uh, this, perhaps. Um, but then the bounds are also shifted along two, like this. Um, so it's going to be the identical area because the shift has happened to the, the function and the bounds. So it's going to be exactly the same as um, uh, as as part A. Uh, so I can say the integral of 3 f of x minus 2 dx is approximately 10.52. Beautiful. Okay, we've got a set of parametric equations and it says that show they, they show they all uh, lie uh, on a straight line. Okay, so two ways of doing this. Um, the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to uh, rearrange for t. Uh, I'm going to rearrange this y equation for t. Um, and that's going to give me y is equal to 2t plus 1. So y times by 2t plus 1 is equal to 6. I'm then going to expand out uh, this bracket. Um, and then I'm going to um, do 6 minus y. I'm going to do that all over, uh, no I'm not, sorry, uh, what am I going to do? Uh, I'm going to say that t is equal to 6 minus y all over 2y, that's what I'm going to do. Yes, 
<laughs> and then I'm going to uh, sublet into the x. Um, so x is equal to 6 minus y over 2y minus 1. Uh, so replacing the t there, and then replacing this t as well with also 6 minus y over 2y, and then plus 1. Okay, I'm going to times uh, top and bottom by 2y, which will give me 6 minus y minus 2y over, again, times through by 2y is going to give me um, 2 lots of 6 minus y, and then plus 2y. Okay, so while I tidy this up, I'll just tell you the other way of doing this. So what you could do is you could find the dy by dx by doing dy by dt over dx by dt, and then show that that is a constant. Uh, and therefore, if it has a constant gradient, it must be a straight line, uh, which I think is a really nice way of doing it as well. Okay, um, so this gives me x is equal to 6 minus 3y over uh, 12. Um, so that gives me um, a half and minus uh, y over 4. Could times through by 4 uh, to get 4x is equal to 2 minus y. Um, so therefore y is equal to minus 4x plus 2. Uh, and therefore we can say that is clearly a linear, uh, that's a straight line. Therefore linear. Okay, um, right, so that's quite good because it then asked me to work out the point of the section with another line. Uh, and because we've got the Cartesian equation, it makes it really straightforward. Uh, we just literally set the two equal to each other. So uh, minus 4x plus 2 is equal to x plus 12. Um, so 2 is equal to 5x plus 12. Um, so yeah, minus 10 and therefore x equals minus 2. Bosh. Okay, we've got parametric differentiation here, um, and we've got these two parametric equations. Uh, the curve crosses the x-axis at the point P, uh, as shown in figure 3. Find the equation of the tangent to C at P. Writing your answer in the form y is equal to mx plus c, where constants are to be found. Okay, um, so the first thing we need is, is the gradient. Um, so in order to do that, we will need to find um, dx by dt, which when I differentiate this, it's going to give me 3 uh, sec squared t. Um, I'm also going to need dy by dt, uh, which when I differentiate this, it's going to give me um, negative 4 uh, sine uh, 2t. Um, so dy by dx is going to be uh, dy by dt uh, divided by um, dx by dt. Okay, um, and now what else do we need to do? It says find the uh, tangent at the point P. So I need to find the t value at the point P. Um, and I know that at the point P, um, the, uh, the y value um, is equal to uh, 0, um, which is also equal to 2 cos 2t. Two um, and I know that cos um, equals 0 at um, pi over 2, so therefore we can say that um, uh, well, first off, we can divide through by 2, um, and then we can say that pi over 2 is equal to 2t, um, so therefore we can say that t is equal to pi over 4. Okay, perfect. Uh, so we know this t value, which is going to be helpful, uh, which means we can now find the gradient uh, at the point p. So dy by dx um, at p is going to equal, when I sub in um, pi over 4 into this, I get uh, I get minus 2 over 3. Uh, so subbing into this, okay, be careful because um, obviously sec squared is on the bottom, so you can move it to the top, so it'll just be minus 4 sine 2t um, times by cos squared t divided by 3. 
Okay, um, so once I've subbed that in, um, I'm still not quite there yet because I do need to find the x coordinate. Um, so the x coordinate at p um, is x is equal to 1 plus 3 uh, tan of pi over 4, um, which is equal to 4. Okay, so now I think I'm good because I have um, my y is equal y minus y one is equal to m x minus x one. Uh, my y coordinate is uh, zero uh, at the point p. My gradient is minus two over three, um, and I've got then x minus four. Okay, perfect. So they want it in just the normal y equals mx plus c. So I just multiply this out and then I times that to get plus eight over three. Okay, perfect. Okay, next, um, it tells me that the curve has equation y equals f of x where f is a function with the domain uh, like this. Find the exact value of the constant k. Okay, so to find um, the domain um, of f of x, that is the same as the range of um, uh, x of t. Okay, so it's the range of the x function um, on the given parametric domain. Okay, so what do we know about this x function? Well, it's essentially uh, going to have the shape of a tan graph. Um, so it's going to look something like this. And if we substitute in minus uh, pi over 6, uh, so when t is equal to minus pi over 6, that will give me that x is equal to uh, obviously 1 plus 3 tan lot of minus pi over 6 um, and that will give me a value of um, 1 minus uh, root 3. Um, so that's the lower limit um, and then the upper limit um, obviously we could check that and when we sub in pi over 3 we would get the upper limit uh, which looks like this. Um, Okay, uh, we don't need to worry about um, the uh, asymptotes coming into play uh, because the asymptotes are at minus pi over 2 uh, and this asymptote over here is at positive pi over 2 so we don't need to worry about those coming into play uh, because the domain is obviously between uh, these two points. Okay, great. Um, and now it says find the uh, range. Uh, oh, sorry, just to, to finish off, of course, we need to state that k is equal to this. Okay, so part C is the range, and again, I'm going to use my knowledge of uh, parametrics uh, and by saying that the range of f of x is equal to the range of uh, y of t, so the y function, so whatever the range is for the y function across this parametric domain. Okay, um, so that is a, um, that's a cos function. Uh, so we can just have a quick sketch of a cos function to see what's going on. Um, so we know cos, well, looks like uh, this. Um, and this time it is uh, cos 2t. So normally cos um, crosses the axis at pi over 2. But because it's cos of 2t, it's been uh, compressed. So it's going to cross this axis at pi over 4. Um, and this one at minus pi over 4. Um, so what are we interested in again? Okay, yeah, we're interested in having a look. Oh, sorry. And also, it's going to max out at 2 because it's um, it's 2 cos 2t. So because of the t multiplied by 2, it's going to max out at 2. Okay, so let's sub in the uh, the upper and lower bound of the, um, of the range, of the, sorry, parametric domain. So when I sub in minus pi over 6, I get 1. Uh, which means that minus pi over 6 right there uh, is going to give me a value of 1. 
uh, like that. And then when I sub in uh, pi over three, um, that's going to give me a value of um, uh, minus one. So um, I could write that pi over um, three would be uh, somewhere over here. Uh, and that would give me a value of uh, minus one. Okay, so uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that the graph is actually uh, just bounded like here. Um, and it has a maximum uh, of two. You can see here at the top, the maximum of two. Uh, and it has a minimum down the bottom of minus one. So the function domain is f of x is bounded in between minus one and two. Sorry, the function's range is bounded between minus one and two. Perfect. Okay, final question. We've made it. Parametric integration and reverse chain rule. Fantastic. Okay, so it says show um, that that region there is bounded um, uh, or just show what the integral is basically to find that uh, region. Okay, so let's start off with what we're going to start off with. Let's start off with the limits. I can see here that that is clearly um, x equals zero, uh, this point here. Uh, we don't know what this point is, but I do know it's when y equals zero because it obviously crosses the uh, x axis. So when x equals zero, um, that means that um, 2 cos 2t two is equal to 0 um, and that means that uh, 0 is equal to cos 2t um, and taking the um, inverse of cos of 0 gives me pi over 2 is equal to 2t um, which tells me that t is equal to pi over 4. Okay uh, so at that point there t is equal to pi over 4. Right, um, next, let's see what happens when y equals zero, because that's gonna be this point here. When y equals zero, uh, four sine t equals zero. Um, and we know that sine is zero when, when the input is zero, so that means that t is zero. So this one is t equal to zero. So it looks like they're the wrong way around, which is important. Okay. Um, next thing I need to do is um, dx by dt uh, for my parametric integration. So differentiating this is going to give me minus 4 sine uh, 2t because uh, cos differentiates to minus sine and the input is 2t so times by the derivative which is 2 uh, times that by 2 gives us 4. Okay so the uh, formula for parametric integration is uh, between a and b uh, y dx by dt times by dt. Um, and that's interesting because uh, it's b and a where b is the um, one you know, furthest to the right um, and a whoops, uh, is the one on the left uh, which in this case is uh, this one. Okay, so I will need to write that it is the integral between um, 0 is the t on the right and pi over 4 is the t on the left. y, which is 4 sine t, multiplied by dx, which is minus 4 sine 2t dt. Okay, great. Um, so this is the integral between 0 pi over 4 of um, minus 16 um, sine t times by sine uh, 2t. Okay, um, so now I'm going to do this little swap over um, whereby we can swap the limits over as long as we multiply the integral by a negative. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details why that is um, because uh, I just I don't think I'm, I'm just not going to do it. 
<laughs> but essentially, if you multiply it through um, an integral by a negative, then it swaps over uh, the limits. So you can, you can multiply through by negative uh, by swapping over the limits. So that's gonna give me pi over four on top um, and zero on the bottom. And it means I can get rid of this negative. Uh, and then I'm gonna multiply that out uh, because I know my, not multiply out, but I know that my uh, double angle formula uh, for sine two t is two sine t cos t. Um, okay, great. So I think we are pretty much there, aren't we? Yes, all I need to do is just write it now. Um, it is the same as 32 um, sine squared t cos t dt. Okay, perfect. All right, I can get rid of that. And... Uh, now we need to actually integrate it. Perfect. So this is reverse chain rule. Um, it's in the function. It's in the um, the form where we have um, a composite function here. We've got um, uh, sine t is the function. Then it's being squared. Um, and then if I were to um, differentiate that function sine, it would give me cos, and that is multiplied by this function. So we can use the reverse chain rule. We can take the sine and we can up the power, so integrate the kind of squared part of the function. Uh, and that gives me um, sine cubed. I would then need to divide by the new power and divide by the derivative of that function sine. But don't forget, we've got the 32 here and we've got the cos t here. And the only reason why this works is because you can cancel out that derivative like that. OK, so that is a fast and quick way of doing reverse chain rule. OK, you can say let um, y equal sine cubed and then you could differentiate sine cubed and find that you get sine, you get free sine squared t cos t. Um, so therefore, the derivative of um, sine cubed gives you something very similar to the integral you're trying to find. Uh, but anyway, this is how I do it. Uh, and it works for me. So happy days. Okay, um, now we need to sub in those limits. So pi over four into sine is one over root two. So cube that, and that's gonna be one over two root two. Um, and when I sub in zero, um, I'm not going to get anything. So it's just this. Um, so this is the same as um, 16 um, over three root two. Uh, because I can do this 32 divided by the 2 is 16 and I can bring the root 2 down to the bottom like that. Um, and then rationalizing this would give me 16 root 2 over um, 3 times by 2. Uh, so that gives me a final answer of 8 root 2 over 3. Perfect. Okay, let me grab some more space. Okay, now part um, uh, part B um, says uh, show that all the points uh, can be satisfied by this. Okay, so we need to find the Cartesian equation uh, essentially. So I'm going to say that x is equal to uh, two cos two uh, t um, because we know there is a double angle formula for cos two t, which is one minus two sine squared t. Um, and we know over here that um, y over 4 is equal to sine t. Um, so now I can substitute in for sine t. Uh, it gives me 1 minus um, 2 lots of y over 4 squared. 
Okay, so now let's do some simplifying. Um, that gives me 2, and that gives me 1 minus um, y squared over 16, but times by 2, so over 8. Um, okay, so then let's multiply through by 2. So it gives me 2 minus y squared over 4. And then um, we need to find it in terms of y, so let's multiply through by 4. Um, which gives me this. Okay, let's then make um, y squared the subject, uh, which will give me 8 minus 4x. And then let's divide, uh, not divide, sorry, let's square root, um, which gives me this. Uh, but then I will write it in the way that they have asked for, um, which will be the square root of minus 4x plus 8. Uh, so therefore the a is equal to minus 4 and b is equal to 8. Okay, lovely. Um, now the final part is to state the range. Um, so the square root function, um, just the general square root function looks like that. It's strictly increasing. Um, it just continues to increase. Um, but here we've got um, a negative x, so it's going to be kind of reflected in the um, the uh, in the y-axis. So it's going to look like that. So it's, going to, but it's still going to be essentially a strictly decreasing function. So that means that I, all I need to do is just sub in uh, x is minus 2 and x is 2, and that will give me the upper and lower um, uh, values for the range. Uh, so if I sub in f of minus 2, I will get... Um, uh, square root 16, which is equal to 4, and if I sub in f of 0, I will get, um, not f of 0, sorry, what am I doing? <laughs> if I sub in uh, 2, because again, like I said before, I'm doing the, the lower bound and I'm doing the upper bound of the domain, uh, which will give me the lower and upper bound of the range. Okay, uh, come on, last question, I can do this. <laughs> And that gives me the square root of uh, zero, which is zero, which means that the range is between zero um, and four. It's in between those two values. Perfect. Okay. Wow. That was intense. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed that. Um, I hope that it's going to be really helpful for um, your revision. Um, and uh, if you did find that useful, then please do consider supporting the channel. Um, by any means, whether that is just um, subscribing to the channel um, or sharing it with a friend, um, that would mean the world to me. Um, okay, so I'll see you soon for some mechanics and stats, and I really hope that your, um, your pure exam goes well. Bye for now.